What I thought we would do is, and I'll remind everybody to use their mics when you're contributing to this, what we'd like to do is just sort of do a little conversation uh, for, till, for the next uh, 20 minutes or so while everybody finishes up eating. And so I, I, I'm not going to give a talk, but what, uh, what I'm more interested in is doing is getting sort of a dialogue. Um, Joe Palco, who's in the back of the room, but will join us shortly, I'm sure, you know, raised the issue that I struggle with and that I know a lot of you struggle with, which is how to talk about this stuff. The concepts are hard. They're not related to anything that's part of our common experience. And the genetics language is both um, disequilibri dis you know, well, it's, it's linkage disequilibrium, is, uh, I find, um, puts me off, uh, as, along with hat maps and alleles and all the other terms that, that we have in this. So the terminology is really terrible. So I was wondering if, if, if anybody has, for a starter, come up with a good metaphor for talking about any of this or has – not that I want anybody to give away any trade secrets because certainly we'll all steal from each other as this goes along. But how, how are you guys sort of talking about or describing these kinds of studies? And I, I would encourage the scientists who also between gulps to sort of throw in their ideas because I think that only sort of by having this conversation are we going to get to some kind of common language that – um, is going to help us be able to explain this to my mother, who still is wondering what it is that I do, along with my director. Does anybody have any any particular good insights into the way that they're approaching this, you know, descriptively or metaphorically? That's that's pretty much my experience too. <laughs> I mean, I, I have to say that I, I really like Dr. Brody's two-sock uh, metaphor for uh, trying to show how one SNP is somewhat predictive of what the other one might look like. This is pretty hard. Yes, please. Just to remember, my, if you could, just tell us who we are because for, so I can identify you later on tape. This is Addison Greenwood from uh, NCI. Um, as far as looking for metaphors, I never look any further than Dr. Collins. I just crib Collins as metaphor? <laughs> to steal and crib unrepentantly. But, but I do find um, more often when, when you're talking with a group than when you're writing and the feedback's not very immediate, that um, I think one of the things we need to think about is the basic, the basic framework that we're using, just inherited versus environmental, can set a lot of readers off on the wrong track. Not to say that we shouldn't use, continue to use that distinction, because if we abandon it, it would be more confusing. But I think that um, in a lot of situations, the operational difference can be framed after you say inherited versus um, environmental. I think that the operational difference often has, has other components, like a temporal component. Most um, uh, environmental uh, impacts are after you're born and, and subsequent, you know, so right. I think that um, rather than making these what we think are simplistic and categorical distinctions that put people in one box or another, I think that as we go through a piece or go through an explanation, the more often we can add different metaphors that, sti that sort of pile up the distinction between one and the other, it, it becomes more cumulative, cumulatively explanatory. Cool. Thanks. There's another thought. For the first time this morning, I'm sure it's not the first time it's been said, but the notion of a, a SNP has a uh, different colored door on a house at the same address or whatever. And I, I just wondered, whoever, probably Dr. Collins that came up with that, but has, are yeah, there He other, doesn't get credit for everything. <laughs> are there logical <laughs> extensions of that that are useful? Um, has that been taken further? Because I'd love to hear if it has. Um, Francis? Not quite like that. <laughs> Joe Palka has already taken me to task with a ticking time bomb, so maybe we ought to <laughs> retire those because they seem a little more scary than an odds ratio of 1.23 ought to convey. <laughs> but I do think the use of the metaphor about searching for the culprit uh, when you're starting with a very large territory uh, and you need a search strategy that's going to get you to the answer, and the answer is to find the right house uh, somewhere in the entire country. And what the tag snips allow you to do is to search neighborhood by neighborhood instead of house by house. 
because we have learned that the genome is organized that way, and that you can, in fact, get the answer without having to look at every single house and see if that's the one. You can first identify whether you're in the right territory uh, using uh, this property of horrendously named linkage disequilibrium. So in that regard, each of the SNPs is really a house, and you're um, assessing whether you're in the place where the causative SNP, because remember, one of these is actually the causative variation that has a functional effect on the genome by modifying the way some gene in that neighborhood is working. But because of the way in which these neighborhoods are all traveling together, you're going to have a long list of other SNPs that are equally impressive as far as their association with the disease, but they're not doing anything. They're along for the ride. So uh, there's a, uh, uh, a two-edged sword here. <laughs> the linkage disequilibrium allows you to scan the whole genome without having to do so darn much work. But when you get a signal, then you're sort of slowed down because it doesn't tell you exactly what the functional variant was. It just tells you you're in the zone where it must be. And then you have to a lot of, do a lot more additional work to figure out which of the maybe 30 or 40 or 50 SNPs that all look equally good are actually the cause of the uh, increased disease risk. And actually, the causality issue is something that I think is something that we really need to worry about in terms of the clarity of the reporting as well and the way we talk about it from the Institute's point of view. I mean, finding a SNP per se is not finding the cause of the disease. It's really finding the region that something is going on in it. And there's a great deal more work that needs to get done to really understand sort of the basic biology that leads to the therapeutic and stuff. We'll hear from that from Dr. Guttmacher later today about the connections between those and, and where that goes. So, you know, the, we, we're already seeing a lot of headlines of, you know, 10 new genes for finding diabetes, you know, found. But really, it's 10 new SNPs that articulate areas of the genome where something important is going on. So, I mean, the precision with which we're talking about this, is it, I, I don't know if we're, comf I don't know if I'm comfortable that we really have a firm handle on it. Maybe it's just that I don't have a firm handle on it. But um, is there a sense that it's more than just me? So one of the other things that, that was in Dr. Manolio's talk earlier today, and I was wondering how you guys are struggling with this or thinking about it, was knowing when the findings that are, you know, that are in the headlines of the science articles or nature articles or whichever uh, really are, are real. And it's the sort of the issue of significance. You know, when is a finding significant enough that it's worth reporting on? How, how are you guys handling that? Anybody have any observations on that? Or, or not. <laughs> so, I mean, it, I, I'm finding that, and, I, and the, the, thing, the corollary that I think is going to become important about this is that most of you have stopped writing about individual genes being found. You know, a gene gets found for X disease, it's like, okay, whatever. Um, and now what we're having is, and, and it was usually for rare diseases, so it was, you know, not, not your, you know, not what's going to be striking your family for the most part. So now we're going to have this shmia of GWAS reports coming out with lots of genes for common diseases. Are we going to run into the sort of the same editor fatigue that people aren't going to want to hear about it anymore because, um, well, we've just heard, you know, 10 stories or 15 stories about common disease genes for heart disease or mental illness or diabetes or whatever. Any sense about how we're going to overcome, Joseph, that issue? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, editor fatigue? Yes. I mean, I, I, it, I, I'm not quite clear as I think about this why this is, should be different in some substantial way from any other problem of explaining science to the public and any other result. I mean, it's not, it's not like landing on Mars where you have a fixed event that you can move forward from. It's uh, a process, okay. and so the que all the questions that you're asking are relevant, but they're they're relevant to every um, set of issues that we cover. But I think, it, and I get this is the way I've been thinking about it, is that what's different about this sto this story, this GWAS story, is that it, it's it's a trend story, and of course editors love trends just like they love dogs and babies, but um, the 
the trend and and the seat the the trend that's changing here is or is is the the sort of the the capacity to do the kinds of studies that hasn't been possible before i mean it's not just the completion of the genome which was in 03 oh my god that's ancient news for most news editors but it's also you know the completion of the hat map which created this tool that's leading to this explosion so there is really waypoints joe You can only do one trend story. And then you have to get back to the. Yeah, well, you can, you can do that. Yeah, new hope or no hope. That's, but no, but the. Thank you, Victor Cohn. You're right, exactly. But the trend, you know, the the, the, the the tension is when, when you know, after you've done the trend story and then there's 50 small. Incremental advances. Mileposts on the trend. Which one do you do and when do you do it again? Well, whenever we send you a press release, of course. <laughs> oh, and buy you lunch, absolutely. Absolutely. What? No, no. <laughs> Francis? Well, it does seem, though, that these will not be all generic stories where you simply do a global replace in your press release and put in the name of the new disease and everything else is the same. Uh, as I'll go into <coughs> talking about diabetes, the things that you discover are themselves, at times at least, kind of interesting. You didn't expect you were going to encounter a zinc transporter that's only expressed in the islet cells of the pancreas uh, when you did this scan of diabetes, for instance. So there's always details in there. Or maybe the phenotype uh, is interesting. Uh, Elaine will hint that we're aware of a paper on human height, and that probably will get people's attention a bit uh, more than, you know, a disease that most people are not as familiar with in their personal experience. We're all familiar with height in our personal experience. The obesity story uh, that came out two weeks ago seemed to get a fair amount of press. Again, here's a validated gene as opposed to previous claims that clearly plays a reasonable role in, uh, in uh, obesity. The homozygotes for the risk allele having something like uh, three pounds heavier than the ones who were not. Um, and everybody's interested in that, especially in our culture. So can't you do something with that instead of saying, oh, it's another genome-wide association study of another disease, uh, make what's interesting out of it the details as opposed to the generic approach? As long as the details are interesting, of course. Right. That zinc, that zinc transporter thing you said was just... <laughs> I, I was actually heading out the door. <laughs> So there, it's clear that what would be interesting to the science types might not always be as similar excitement to the uh, the general population. I I think that's fair. So that's a sort of a cautionary tale for moderation of expectations, uh, you scientist types. <laughs> Ma'am, I am talking exactly the. No. Yes, ma'am. It's Joanna from ABC again. Um, yes. I'm slightly different, I think, than most people in the room in that we're television and also instead of print. And then we are somewhat self-limiting in the amount of time we devote to stories. So frequently, a piece on world news will be a minute and 30 seconds, where you have to try and communicate, you know, the entire story in that short amount of time. And we don't do very many genetic stories at all. Because they're so visual. Exactly. It, first of all, what do you show? Right. And second of all, how, how do you even talk about it? If you're talking about a SNP, you have to back up. Most people only have a vague concept of what a gene is and how it relates to a protein and what a SNP is. And, and so, But you've used up all your time and more just laying the groundwork to be able to get to the significance of the findings. So that's, we end up not doing anything at all. So, well, that's why we need you to come up with a great metaphor. I'm not sure it's even going to be possible <laughs> in a metaphor form to do it in a minute and 30. Yes, Chris. Hi, Chris Wanjik now with NIH. I think uh, the greatest difficulty for me in writing about these things, um, and I still do outside of NIH, is the implication. Uh, I don't know if it's a, a certain moral obligation uh, when we talk about genome. What's it, what's it mean? We're going to hear about uh, disease and genes uh, with uh, diabetes. Uh, diabetes is now the leading killer in Mexico. And 15 years ago, it hardly existed. The gene pool hasn't changed. And there's such implications with lifestyle. Same with obesity as well. You report these things, and genes more and more are becoming a cop-out that we can't do. We can't change um, our body because of these genes. 
And that's the hardest thing for me to relay, this understanding. I know it's supposed to be a balanced nature versus nurture, nature versus molestation, whatever you want to call it. That, um, <laughs> it's, uh, I, I never understand the balance to report and, and what's the long-term implication. We're going to replace these genes with, say, lung cancer or smoking. We never said, you know, what is the genetic underpinning of lung cancer? Let's correct it. Let's correct it so we can keep on smoking. Uh, maybe that's a fine idea. I don't know. But uh, That was the background for the search for the safe cigarette, which happened all through the 70s. Oh, is that so? Yeah, absolutely. So, that, so NCI has spent thousands, millions of dollars on the search, for, along with the industry, of course, which led to whatever that cigarette was that was a synthetic, a fake cigarette in the, the late 80s. Well, anyway, difficult uh, problem for me is how to relay something about the discovery of obesity genes. And, and I think that's, that you, Chris, you raise a really a critical issue, frankly. I mean, we're in the Genome Institute, so we tend to, you know, everything looks like a gene to us. And, of course, lots of things. Uh, uh, genes are not predeterminate. I mean, if you have the gene for Huntington's, you're probably going to get Huntington's. That's a bad one because the penetrance is so high. But the stuff we're talking about now are weak effects that sum up to give you an increased risk. But if you have a, the genes that will lead you to be obese, but you maintain your caloric intake, you still won't become obese. Or I'm Irish. The, my favorite example is I may have inherited the genes to be an alcoholic. So, but if I never drink, then I won't ever become an alcoholic. So there is this environmental uh, interaction that occurs with whatever our genetic makeup is that determines what our trajectory in our life is and what diseases that, that we get. But certainly, we, we would, I would argue, or we would argue that understanding the genetic basis of it is a really important step to being able to intervene in ways in our environment. I mean, medicine is essentially part of our environment to be able to forestall those diseases from occurring and, um, and, and us getting sick. It's, it's critically, I think it's critically important in our stories that we remember that. We certainly try to include that in our press releases and in the backgrounders that we do, uh, although we are very genome-centric, I, I you know, fully uh, confess our bias in that regard. It, it, oh, Dr. Gutmacher. Yeah, with some from that last conversation. Uh, the first is clearly that in understanding the genes involved in disease, often and most often, as Larry was saying, we're not going to change the gene at least in the next many decades. We're going to change the environment. But by understanding how the gene relates to the disease gives us clues to how to change the environment, using the environment very broadly, including medications. Clearly, the, mo the, the most famous medication example of that is familial hypercholesterolemia. Now, that's not GWAS study, that's single gene, et cetera. Rare disease, by understanding that decades ago, that there was this rare genetic variant that could lead to this huge increase in cholesterol, that explicated basically the causation of atherosclerosis in a way we never understood before. And that told us that G cholesterol levels really are important in atherosclerosis, and that was the birth of statins, which are, you know, now among the most widely used drugs that we have and had a huge public health impact, having nothing to do with genetics, really, in terms of most people that use them don't have variants in hypercholesterolemia, but that is uh, useful to them. Similarly, many of the things that we learn about genius and GWAS studies will tell us about the basic biology of disease. I'm going to talk later in the afternoon, many of you will know already, the story of had an onset macular degeneration. And um, that was a GWAS approach, which came up with several genes that are involved with that they turn out to be involved in inflammatory pathways. Before that discovery, very few people thought of AMD as the primarily in, um, inflammatory disease. But by understanding the involvement of genes there, that is going to be useful for people who have fairly common the population have variants that put them at increased risk for AMD, but also for anybody else who doesn't have those genetic variants, still by having a new understanding of the disease process, genetics will point us to new kinds of interventions and prevention strategies most of them environmentally, using that term broadly, based. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm going to, we'll, we'll wrap this up in a minute. There's just two other areas that I want us to, want you guys to be thinking about, or at least that we're thinking about, or know that we're thinking about. Uh, you'll hear uh, from my colleague, uh, Vince Bynum, in a little bit about uh, race and genetics, but we often, uh, we've heard it talked about today, and we've seen it in some of the papers that are in your books, uh, about ethnic, ethnically homogenous populations. And um, that's a really complicated subject that needs to be approached thoughtfully. Uh, I think it can be done, and it's a powerful tool in genetics, uh, but it's also it's laden with a lot of sort of social, uh, you know, 
baggage, frankly, and Vince will talk about that, and maybe I'll just not talk about that now and let that be part of it um, for his session. And the other issue that there's going to be a lot of stories about uh, in, the coming, in the coming months and years as these GWAS studies go forward is looking at phenotypes that are behavioral and linking them to the genomes. These are going to be really complicated, and we're seeing a lot, we're starting to see hints of those kinds of studies already coming out, um, but it's, behavior is so multifactorial uh, and it has so many genes. We, I don't have any idea if anybody's ever estimated the number of genes that are involved in any kind of neurological organization of the brain. Uh, I don't know what the estimate is if, there, if somebody else does in the room. But it's clearly going to be a very complicated phenomenon, and we're starting to see some bits of that already, and Elaine will talk, Dr. Ostrander will talk about that in her talk, starting from dog models and extrapolating forward to humans. But one can imagine how loaded all this stuff is going to be, and we even know, I mean, historically, if you think back just, you know, not that many years ago, there was an NIH director at the Institute of uh, Mental Health, National Institute of Mental Health, who essentially lost his job because he agreed to uh, that, he defended a study that was being uh, funded at the University of Maryland that was looking at aggressive behavior in primates and was, uh, and he uh, suggested that um, this might be a useful thing to study and you could learn interesting things about it. Seems like an outrageous statement to have made, uh, and, but it, it got spun up in a lot of emotion about, you know, which populations is he talking about and who does he mean and what does he mean by that? And ultimately, he was basically driven out of his job. Um, so the sensitivities that are amongst our audiences are quite remarkable, and uh, we can stumble into them um, uh, dangerously if we're not really thoughtful about the way we approach these studies. So we'll hear about some of the science that's going on in, uh, in, in the area of genes and behavior. Um, and you should, you know, this is going to be a very fascinating area. It's going to be fraught with a lot of conversation, I suspect.